great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Great your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your peace. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Sing that again, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. So remember your people, so remember your people. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Heaven reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. God, I sing your grace is enough. And I'm covered in your love. Your grace. First one up that we have to share with you today is uh, the Covenant Membership 101 class. It's going to take place on April 21st, and that'll be from noon to 4, and there'll be a lunch provided. It's right after church. Uh, that used to be like a four-day class. They've just kind of compressed it into meeting one day, and you can sign up in the foyer or talk to an elder. They'll give you some help with that. If you need child care, it is also available upon request, okay? Um, next up, the next baptism is going to be on March 10th. Um, you'd want to contact one of our elders, and if you'd like to speak with them uh, about being baptized, they'll take care of that for you. Um, or you can contact the church office if you just want to give them a call and ask what's going on there. Um, who are the elders? Um, there they are. There's Kurt and Sami, Tom, Brent, and if you can't see the names on the bottom, there's Grady and Jim. Um, so if you see them walking around or you want to talk to them, give the office a call and they can pray for you or any other questions that you may have for them about the church or any of the events that we're going over that are in your handout. Next step on our list, we have the Valentine's dinner, D D Valentine's Day dinner. That'll be February 16th, so that's on Saturday down at the Old Spaghetti Factory near the Promenade in, uh, down in Clackamas. And if you want to contact Mike or Teresa Field, they can give you some more information relating to that. 
Um, they do want to have reservations so that way they don't know how many people and then the menu can be set in the choice of the menu. Also today, if you didn't know, uh, there is a potluck right after church um, next door over here in the fireside room. So um, if your last name was uh, ending in A through M, you can help clean up. And uh, M through Z was to help set up. So hopefully it's just not all M through Z there today. Um, also wanted to bring up the deacon fund, uh, the funds used to assist people in our church who may be in financial need. It's a great and worthy cause. It's an excellent ministry to help with. Um, if you want to give to that, we have the donation boxes, or if you feel that you or someone that you know in our church has a need, then by all means, contact the church office, any of the elders. Um, it's distributed and handled all internally. If you could just take a moment and stand for me and say hello to someone who's near you and greet them and let them know who you are. Thank you. in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still
became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so
this morning we come before you and we thank you that we can boldly proclaim that uh, you are our Savior, you're our Messiah. And so this morning as we gather, I pray that you would encourage us. Lord, allow us to even take advantage of this time to, to be bold, to proclaim you as our Lord and Savior. Because we know once we leave this place, it's not always so easy. So this morning, uh, we would be encouraged. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Masami. Exciting things are happening around the world as God moves and draws people to Jesus Christ. Children, I'm going to invite you to be dismissed right back here to get a folder and go back to your seat. Parents will be sharing communion, and if you've been with us for a while, you know how that works. You'll be able to come down and take those elements. Please take the time with your children to talk about that, pray with them, and help them understand that fully. As they're doing that, I am privileged to announce that uh, Riley DeRosha is uh, wanting to be a part of our church family and covenant membership, so I announce that name to you. I don't think Riley's here right now because her father, Dean, um, uh, has had a couple of seizures recently. They had to take him to the hospital, so please be in prayer for Dean and, uh, and the family there as they uh, kind of find out all that's going on there and adjust medications, and God's done an amazing work in Dean's life. It's been amazing to watch him progress every week, so keep praying for him, please. We are in the book of Colossians, and you see the text there that we'll be in. You can turn there if you'd like in your own Bibles. Uh, as you know, on Sunday mornings as we gather together, I use the screens a lot and just try to put a lot of scripture up there. Uh, it's really just so we can cover ground and do some, hopefully, some effective teaching there. But I hope you do have your Bibles, and we unpack these things a little bit more in our home groups. Let me take you back to 1969 as we kind of set the stage for uh, this particular passage. In a place called Pass Christian, Mississippi, a group of people were gathered together for a hurricane party. They'd been through many storms, and a new storm was on the approach, um, a storm named Camille. As they were beginning their party there in this posh apartment complex, uh, the police arrived and they told them, you know, you really need to leave. The storm's really going to be intense. We really urge you to leave. And, and as they were telling them about the, the force of this storm coming, uh, all the guests at the party laughed. They'd been through many storms before. They were just going to party this one out. They said, if, uh, if you want us to leave, you're going to have to arrest us. Well, the police chief didn't think that was have any really authority to do that so he let them be but he did something interesting he got their names and the names of their next of kin because he knew what was coming one of the strongest storms and actually today still the strongest storm with mile um, winds 205 miles per hour approached mississippi So at 10.15 that night, the storm approached. They say that uh, raindrops hit with the force of bullets. The waves crashed the shore at 28 to 30 feet tall. So here was the news report the next morning. The news told that the worst damage hit at a little settlement of hotels and bars and posh apartments known as Pass Christian, where some 20 people were killed at a hurricane party in the upscale apartments, and nothing was left of the three-story apartment structure but the foundation. So our text today begins with a warning. And a warning that's connected with where we were last week in our text. Remember, the Apostle Paul was deeply concerned about these believers. He wasn't present with them at the time. But he was concerned about a storm that was kind of brewing in them and around them, a storm of false teaching. And he wanted them to be prepared. So we, we began that theme last week. We're going to see it again today, and we're going to see it again next week in our text. 
A storm was coming, and here's how the text begins today in Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So this warning, it, it comes in a very direct, a very powerful, a very potent way. It, it's not a casual warning, it's a very severe warning. And we see that as we dig even more into those three words right at the beginning, see to it. Could be translated probably better, look out, watch out, take heed, take note, be aware of what's around you. Not just being aware of it, but being aware and as you see it, take appropriate action. This is a warning to see and to take note and to change your actions. It's what he's telling these early believers. It's what we read today, some centuries later. As I thought about that idea of seeing and taking action, I thought of the fact that uh, it's been a number of years ago now that I started riding a motorcycle. And from day one that I started riding that motorcycle, I took a new interest in road signs. Now, it's interesting as we drive cars that we can see road signs and we can see them and we really don't take note of them because we, we just don't take it seriously, whether it's sharp curves or an intersection or speed limits, whether it's a rough road or a sunken grade. When you're in a car, you never even notice those things. But when you're motorcycle, I've noticed it's a little bit different. I remember talking with a friend shortly after getting my motorcycle and saying in a very naive way, you know, I feel kind of vulnerable on my bike. And he laughed and said, brother, you are vulnerable. There is nothing between you and that other vehicle. Now, I knew that, and I felt that, and so I began to look at these signs much different. Now, when there's an intersection coming, I'm aware of that. I change my actions because I'm vulnerable. I recognize that. See, the Apostle Paul, as he told these people to beware, he's saying, beware and respond and take action, change, take note, adjust your course. Just digging again into this phrase that's actually one word in the original language, and it's in a tense that, that says this needs to be an habitual action for you. It's in a, in a mood that indicates that it's a command, not just a suggestion. It's in an active voice, which means you need to do this. Somebody else is not going to do this for you. And it's plural, which means it's for the whole church, not just the church leaders. Now, I want to be quick to tell you that it's our job as church leaders to do our part to protect the flock from false teaching, to make it known to you, to highlight it, to say beware of that and don't buy into that. But, of course, we can't be with the flock all the time. I suppose I could tell you to, to give us a call every time you turn to the church channel and we'll come over and sit down and watch it with you, but that's not just going to work, is it? So it's for all of us. We all need to be aware and, and adjust and take note of the storm that's around us, even this storm of false teaching that's here now. So understand, this is a packed word as it starts. See to it. Beware. What are the consequences? If we're not aware, if we don't take note, if we don't adjust. Remember last week I shared a little bit about Jim Jones and the People's Temple, and it's a very vivid example of what happens when people are not aware of false teaching and, and that persuasive, even often charismatic and, and drawing message. So this text, as we get further into it, talks about the consequences. See to it that no one takes you captive. The consequences were taken captive. And again, that's a very vivid word as it's first communicated. It's another military term or a, 
uh, military phrase. It means literally to strip off the weapons of an enemy and carry them away. This is the only place in the New Testament that we see this word used. And of course, in the historical context that it was written, that was actually what happened when an, when an army would come in and capture a city, they would literally strip the army of all their weapons and strip the city of all the wealth and they would take everybody captive back to their city or back to their country. It's what they did. So they understood this when they first read it. Of course, we see many examples of that in, the, in Scripture. So again, let me understand, help you understand the concern is that these first century believers, and then every generation of believers after them, that's including us, are not to fall prey to false teaching, to nice-sounding teaching, to well-presented teaching. Don't allow it to strip you of your weapons and take you captive. Remember, Jesus told his disciples that they would know the truth, and the truth would give them what? Freedom. You know my truth, and you'll be free, free to act and free to live and free to know the, the ways of God and free to respond. And, and so just the opposite happens when we believe the lie, when we believe deception, there is bondage, and that's the concept he's communicating. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So we want to understand where does this attack, where does this threat come from, where did it come from back then? What we see is it can, continues to come in the same way. So there's three areas, there's three paths. First one, it says... There's philosophy and empty deception. I'll suggest to you that that phrase empty deception is, is illustrating what philosophy is. Philosophy is an interesting word. It literally means a love of wisdom. A philosopher then is literally, in this Greek word that we see almost parallels, it's a mirror image of our English word, a philosopher is somebody that loves wisdom. That sounds very noble, doesn't it? Shouldn't we all love wisdom and even be in a pursuit of wisdom? Shouldn't we all be philosophers in that sense? But it's interesting that the Apostle Paul links philosophy with empty deception. So we need to understand why he's not saying philosophy is good if it's the love of wisdom. See, the critical piece in this discussion is determining a starting point of wisdom, a starting point of knowledge. When the Apostle Paul in this text and some others we'll see here shortly speaks of philosophy in a negative or even a harmful way, here's what he's speaking of. Now get this. He's speaking of a philosophy that starts from human reasoning not from divine revelation. Let me say that again. What he's referring to here is this philosophy that starts from what we can figure out with our own human reasoning apart from what God has divinely revealed to us. See, looking for and loving wisdom is a great thing to do. But if we look for wisdom and yet exclude the most significant source of wisdom, what do we have? We have what's on the screen. Empty deception. Let me just show you a couple of Old Testament passages that relate to this. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Later, in Proverbs, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So you see, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding all begin at one place. In the acknowledgement of God, and even a 
an appropriate fear of God, that's where it always begins. So if we look for wisdom, even if we look for knowledge, and we don't start there, it's an empty search. We've excluded the primary source of wisdom and knowledge in our world. And let me remind you, just in one of our previous passages here in Colossians, these believers were told that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you see what he's saying here? This is not a rant against philosophy in the literal sense. We all should be lovers of wisdom. What it is, it's a warning that philosophy or any science apart from the acknowledgement of divine revelation will only and always lead you astray. What is philosophy? Well, it's the love of what? It's the love of wisdom. But let me give you a definition. This is the modern definition. If you look up philosophy, it says something like this. The use of reason and argument in seeking truth and knowledge of reality, especially of the causes and nature of things, and of the principles governing existence, the material universe, perception of physical phenomena, and human behavior. It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Now look at that definition. Can you really know the reality of anything if you exclude God from the very beginning? Can you really know the nature of things? Can you really know the principles that govern existence and even human behavior if you exclude God from the beginning? If you do exclude God from the very beginning in philosophy, what you end up with is strange and even foolish and convoluted ideas in the midst of it all. Someone said that philosophers are people who talk about something they don't understand and then make you think it's your fault. Now, if you've ever had conversations with people in philosophy, that's exactly true. They're talking about what they don't understand, excluding God in trying to understand it, and then you leave feeling like somehow this is your fault, that they don't understand and that there's no information. Another one said, philosophy is man's attempt to befuddle himself scientifically. It's like they love this idea that, oh, it's, it's just mystery and beyond us, and we come up with all these different things, and they feel good about arriving there. See, philosophy that is devoid of divine revelation and acknowledgement and submission of of ourselves to the truth of God leads absolutely nowhere. And that's the point the Apostle Paul is bringing to these people. Now I'm going to camp here a little bit because we're in this culture even today about philosophic, nice sounding things. And I want to take you to Acts chapter 17, a conversation that the Apostle Paul had with some philosophers. It was in Athens. And you're going to see a couple phrases about Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Let me give you a couple definitions. I realize this is a lot of information. What is Epicureanism? Because it's going to be in this text in just a moment. Founded around 300 years before Christ, it denies any aspect of divine intervention and believes that pleasure is the greatest good. But the way to attain pleasure is to live modestly and to gain knowledge of the workings of the world and the limits of one's desires. Sounds pretty current, doesn't it? It's still a very popular philosophy under a different name. Stoicism is interesting. It teaches the development of self-control and fortitude as a means of overcoming destructive emotions. The philosophy holds that becoming a clear and unbiased thinker allows one to understand the universal reason, which is logos. That might take you to the book of John, chapter 1. A primary aspect of Stoicism involves improving the individual's ethical and moral well-being. These were the 
the mindsets, the ways of thinking that the Apostle Paul enters into as he talks with some people here in this next text. So in Acts chapter 17, we read this. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be proclaiming strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him, they brought him to the Oropagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling and hearing something new. Interesting interaction. I want to just draw three things from that. First of all, if you look at that last line, actually the part that's in the brackets, telling and hearing something new, that was the focus of these people. What is new? What is novel? What's different? What's fresh? What's original? Does that sound very much like our culture today? People trying to deconstruct what established truth is and come up with some new and novel way to think of it. Putting different terms on old realities to somehow make it new and different and even more appealing. The end result is always pointless. I want you to notice also that the Apostle Paul did not shy away from the philosoph uh, philosophers, but he entered into conversation with them. And we will notice that later on, uh, you can read the last part of Acts chapter 17, he actually knew their poetry. He quotes their poetry. He uses their poetry to get them to think about even the pointlessness of their poetry. So understand, we're not to be afraid of philosophy even in the worldly sense. We can enter into that knowing that we have the divine revelation revealed in God's word that actually makes light of or brings light to their pointless pursuit. The last thing I want you to notice going back to this first, the first part, of the, part of the passage, what was it that he was telling these philosophers as he entered into conversation with them? It says, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching who? Jesus and the resurrection. This is what I love. When he stepped into conversation with them, he said, listen guys, I understand what your poets say, but here's the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is who you need to understand. Jesus is the Logos the full revelation of God. He preached Jesus to them as they came to him with their philosophy. You know what philosophers of every age need? They need Jesus. We don't change the message as we speak to a philosopher. It's the same message, Jesus. It's the same message for engineers. It's the same message for scientists. It's the same message for politicians, although I know you'd like to give them another message at times. But it really is the same message. They need Jesus. So we need not back down, even if when we bring Jesus to be the center of the issue, even if they reject it, he's still the center of the issue. See, you can't reason your way to a right relationship with God. You can only repent your way to a right relationship with God. And if philosophers are trying to reason themselves into truth, and you can't. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing 
But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach, say it, Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, foolishness, foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What a powerful text. The cross is foolishness to the philosophers and most in our world today. But this says the foolishness of God is what? Or the foolishness that, that, that of God to men is actually the very wisdom. So Jesus to many may be a strange deity. Jesus to many may be just another man, but Jesus is still the issue. Amen? He is still our message. Charles Spurgeon said something that struck me. He said, modern philosophers will accept anything except the bleeding substitute for guilty man. Everything else is acceptable, except God came in Christ, hung on the cross, to reveal truth, and even to bring salvation. Those words by Charles Spurgeon spoke in the 1800s, so current, so relevant even today. So I purposely spent some time there, church, because I know you interact with people that come with this philosophic, great-sounding ideas. They need Jesus. Present Jesus to them. But there's another path that the storm comes in. He says, tradition of men. Going back to Colossians, the tradition of men. What is a tradition? Literally, it means things that are passed on. And that's a great definition of a tradition. It's what we pass on to people. The way we do things, the way we think, we pass things on. And can I say there's nothing wrong with good traditions? It's just that the bad traditions that are bad. What is a good tradition? A good tradition is a, is a tradition that is subservient to the clear written word of God. A good tradition is, a, is, is always pointing us to Jesus. And anything other than that is a bad tradition. Anything other than that that we pass on to people is a bad tradition because it's not subservient to the truth of God and it doesn't point us ultimately to Jesus as the way to God. I won't say too much here because it actually comes up in next week's message as we talk about tradition. But I will take you to Mark chapter 7 where Jesus confronted those who highlighted their traditions and here's what he said. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, but their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commandments of God and are looking or holding on to the what? Traditions of men. See, Jesus was furious with that. The religious leaders who took the word of God set it aside and say, no, we have a tradition that supersedes that. And, and they did that so that they could control the situation and even control people instead of allowing the word of God, the truth of God, to speak into people's lives. Traditions. They certainly have their place, you know, and many people for church today, it needs to be without any tradition. And so they just come, they do whatever is a appropriate or feels good at the time and so if you get into that and you do that week after week what do you have you just have a new tradition 
just a new way of doing things. And so we now have these, these uh, just a new way of doing church, all these new traditions, and that's really all they are, new ways of doing them. And ultimately, there's nothing wrong with them unless they are not based on the Word of God and they don't point us to Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul mentions one more area to be wary of. He says the elementary principles of the world. I have to confess, that's a tough phrase to unpack. If you go back to how it's originally written, it means literally something in an orderly arrangement. In most of the ways it's used, it denotes fundamental principles or elementary principles that guide somebody. Now what's interesting is this same word is used in next week's text, and it says that we have died to these elementary principles. So what are they? See, the elementary principles of the world are the ways of thinking and, and the things that we pursue that ultimately lead nowhere. It makes me think of Proverbs 16 where it says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of what? Death. This is what he's talking about. There's ways of thinking in the culture that seem really good and actually feel really good and actually have a temporary sense of fulfillment in your life, but ultimately they lead you to death. But I'm, I'm wondering, what are these elementary principles? We could go to many passages to try to unpack that. I just want to take you to the writings of the Apostle John. In the letters of the Apostle John, he talks about the difference between the world, the light, the world that is dark and Jesus who is light. And here's what he says about the world. This is in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, notice he, he unpacks three things. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the what? It's from the world. I'm going to suggest to you that those are the elementary principles of our world right there. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, all that our physical bodies want, we want our desire to be comfortable, our, our desire to be somehow physically satisfied, the lust of the eyes, wanting and seeing and just absorbing all that we can see because we think there's somehow satisfaction in that, and then the pride of life. What can I do? What can I accomplish? It's all about me. These are the elementary principles that drive our world. When you watch the Super Bowl this afternoon, you can put each one of the $4 million 30-second commercials in one of those categories. Did you catch that? $4 million for 30 seconds of your attention. Every one of those commercials that you either laugh at or cover your eyes at Every one of them will fit into this category. Either it's appealing to the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, or our pride. It drives the world system. So getting back to Colossians, the Apostle Paul is warning us, do not be taken captive by philosophic reason that reject the clear revelation of God. Do not be taken captive by traditions that don't point you to Jesus Christ and that are not based on the Word of God. Don't be taken captive by those elementary principles that drive everything around us. Wake up. Open your eyes. Change course. Read that verse with me out loud, please. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Now highlight that last phrase. See, while we can unpack each one of those, each one of those, the Apostle Paul is set up in opposition to who? Jesus Christ. And that then becomes the crux of the issue. 
that then and Jesus Christ then becomes the real issue. Here's what we need to be aware of, church. Any teaching, any ministry that rejects Christ, minimizes Christ, marginalizes Christ, or tries to reinvent Christ needs to be set aside as heresy. Here's the real test. Here's the real issue. Here's what we have to take note of, if I can say it over and over and over again. Does the teaching that you're watching or hearing make much of Christ, or does it make much of human effort? Does the teaching exalt the person and work of Christ, or does it exalt the thoughts and abilities of man? Does the teaching make much of the fact that true life is only found in Jesus Christ apart from anything else that this world has to offer. Understand it's not necessarily about having your best life now. It's about living in submission to God even for something that is eternal. So it only makes sense when, when the Apostle Paul makes that clear distinction. It only makes sense that we read what's next. Now, what you're going to read next up on the screen here, as you see that on the screen, in the English, that's one sentence. For in him, talking about Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority, and in him you have you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. I actually tried to read that earlier this week with one breath, and it's not actually possible to do. That is one sentence. Have you ever heard the, the, the phrase, that's a Pauline sentence? That's what it means. It's this long, packed, pregnant, full verse that just has one amazing statement after another. But then he gives us another packed sentence in verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us which was hostile to us and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross. Now I don't know what I was thinking when I thought I could preach all of that in one message but that was indeed the plan. But we would miss the 49ers beating whoever that other team is if we did that. So we're going to cover three phrases and three phases only, okay? Here it is. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Understand, the Apostle Paul just said, it's all about Christ. All of this stuff is contrary to Christ. So let me tell you about Christ. There is no clearer statement in Scripture that declares the full and eternal deity of Christ than the statement you see right there on the screen. There is no better place to go while you could go to many other places, there's no better place to go that says that Jesus is, Jesus was, and Jesus will always be God. He is not part God. He did not become God at one time. He has always been God. And if he's anything less than God, he is not worthy of our worship. That word dwells that you see there is an amazing word. It means literally to settle down in a place to take up permanent residence. It's in the tense that says that it has always been. It's always been this way. In Christ, he has always had all of God in him. Now understand, every cult and every other religion is in conflict with this truth. Catch that now. Every cult and every other false religion is in conflict with this truth. Truth. The Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, they are cults, not because they are not great people doing good things, often living lives much better than we live. That has nothing to do with the issue. 
They are a cult because they are wrong about Jesus, who he is, what he has done. They're very sincere. They're very hardworking people. They are people of great faith. But their faith is not in this Jesus. It's in a Jesus that became God at one time. And that is not a saving faith in anything less than the eternal God in Jesus Christ. Now notice the connecting thought. After clearly saying that Jesus is completely God, it says, and in him you have been made what? See, you can't be complete if Jesus is not completely God. You understand the connection he's making there. If he is anything less than completely God, then we have a lot of work to do to, to become complete. Having been made complete, it means to com be completely filled with the implication that then we're controlled by this thing that we're filled with. Now, understand to be complete in Christ does not mean that we're perfect. It simply means that what has been required of us by God has been completely satisfied in what Jesus Christ has done. To be sure, we are all a work in progress. But understand that from an eternal, divine perspective, the work has already been done by Christ on our behalf. We have been made complete. J. Vernon McGee, that old uh, gnarly preacher, actually I don't know if he was gnarly, he just sounded gnarly when he preached. He's long been dead, but you can still hear him on the radio. He says this is a nautical term referring to a ship that is packed and filled, pre prepared for a voyage, and it's all that's needed for the voyage. Understand, that's what we have in Christ. We have all that we need in this life and in the next. An author writes a story about a poor European family many years ago who saved their money to be able to get on a, on a ship and sail to America. Very poor family, and they saved their money. They bought the tickets, and they packed any food that they had, and and all they had was bread and cheese, and they rationed it, but this was a long trip, and eventually they ran out of food. The young boy said, Dad, I just need some food. And so the dad gave the child the last nickel he had, and he says, Go and see if you can buy some food somewhere. The child was gone for hours. Finally, the child came back with this great big smile on his face, the father says, where have you been? He says, well, I've been in the galley, and I've been eating food. I've been eating steaks and full meals and three ice cream cones. And he said, you got that all for a nickel? The son says, no, Dad, I found out that all the food is free. It comes with the ticket. It's kind of like one of those all-inclusive resorts. I've never been to the one, but I guess once you're there, once you're in, it's like all free. Understand that when we step into our relationship with God and Jesus Christ, it's all free after that. He's provided it all. He's bought the ticket, and so all we have is in him, and we keep going to him, and he keeps giving to us. We are complete in Christ. Please don't let anyone ever tell you anything else, that somehow you need to now do more. You need another experience. You need some sort of novel new new way of thinking about something. The last phrase we mentioned today is that he is head over all rule and authority. Now understand in the context of this letter originally written, they were all taken up with angels and spirits and emanations and visions. And they'd seen this and they felt this and, and they had these very uh, unique and yet real experiences in the spiritual realm. And yet the Apostle Paul states in no uncertain terms that Jesus is the head over every other spiritual realm, every other spiritual being. Can I remind you that Jesus has no rivals, he has no equals, he has no competition. This verse says he is what? Head. That means the authority over book of Hebrews makes that point 
that angels worship Jesus. Angels are only servants, and Jesus is the king. So let me encourage you not to allow Star Wars to shape your theology. There is not a dark side that's somehow equal yet opposite to the good side. Certainly there is a dark side, but it's not equal to the good side. Certainly it is opposed to the good side, but the dark side is in submission to and controlled by Jesus. Scripture goes on to say and tell us that for a time, this world has been given uh, or given over to or delegated to Satan to influence it the way he has. Just last week I had a conversation with a young lady who was troubled by visions and dreams that she had had and some of the feelings she was having. You know, it wasn't my place to somehow tell her she hadn't had those dreams or had those visions. But yet what I was very quick to tell her is that if she's a follower of Jesus, she has the very delegated authority of Jesus Christ to stop those things in her life. Because Jesus is the head over all rule and all authority. I had the privilege of telling her that Jesus is the Lord and every other spiritual power that may be trying to influence her or even harass her could be and is subject to Jesus Christ. See, we live in a culture no different than the first century with angels and mystics and fortune tellers, very, very spiritual people, but not willing to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the head, the authority in it all. So, the warning is clear. The threat is always present. There it is in front of you. Church, take heed. Beware. Keep looking to Jesus. Take note of any teaching or any ministry that doesn't make much of Jesus. Take note of any teaching or any ministry that fails to present him fully as he is. Somehow minimizes him or reinvents him or exalts human effort, even in salvation, apart from God's grace. Take note of it. Turn away from it. I just love it when uh, in God's providence we have portions of Scripture that fit so well with where we're at as a church family. So today we have the opportunity to come to these tables and share communion today. And these communion elements remind us of who? Jesus. It's always where we go back to. He's always the one that we go back to. I'm going to invite Masami to come up. Paris, can the musicians come up as well? If you have your Bibles, you can just take them out, open them to Matthew chapter 26. We take part in the, the sac- sacrament, the rem- remembrance of Christ. Command to us, like Pastor Brent was mentioning, since we've been made complete in Him, the one who has all authority has given us something to remember Him. And that's what we're going to take in today, take part in. So, Matthew chapter 26, beginning of verse 26, He's sitting down, it's just before He's about to be betrayed, He's having His last meal with the disciples for the crucifixion. It reads in verse 26, And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink it, I will not drink of its fruit, the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out the Mount of Olives. In Corinthians, Paul reminds us to do this continually and proclaim the Lord's death and presence. 
until he comes back again. Amen? He is coming back. And he wants us to remember all that he's done on our behalf and to do that continually. There are a lot of things that distract us, that vie for our attention. But we need to constantly remember Christ gave his body and his blood for us. And when we receive that and believe in who he is, it changed us. He now indwells us. Here at this church family, uh, if you're newer with us, um, the musicians are going to play four songs. Um, and they even play more than that. <laughs> but uh, there'll be plenty of time for you to sit and, as the scriptures say, to spend time examining yourselves, spend time remembering his work on our behalf. And so I want to implore you to do that now. Take your time. There's no rush to come with your families or by yourself when you're ready. There's five stations, a couple in the back, some up front. Come and take communion when you're ready, when you've spent time remembering the new covenant, the work the Lord has done on our behalf, and the fact that he is waiting to partake of it again until we're with him in his presence forever. Would you join with me in prayer? Lord, thank you so much for the work you've done for us. That you have taken our place. You've become our substitute. Lord, thank you that you died on the cross. Lord, you did live that perfect life. You, you taught us everything we need to know to understand the way of life eternally. So, Lord, as we uh, take part in this sacrament together, as we, as we spend time remembering, Lord, your sacrifice for us, your substitute for us, would you again renew and remind fresh in our minds, Lord, that it is complete. It is everything that we need. We want to thank you for that. Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord, allow them to just sit and to be convicted by you. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, you don't need to take part in this time of communion. This is for those who believe it's a thing that's uh, called on us to do. So do not feel obligated. I, I would even say don't feel pressured to stay where you're at. And I want to challenge you to consider the things of Christ and who he says he is. But for those of us who believe, spend time examining before you come and partake. Lord, thank you again so much that you've loved us enough to restore us back into relationship with yourself. We love you and ask all this in your son's name. Take
Come here. 
that saves. And I trust this morning that uh, you've experienced that in a personal way. If not, uh, he does do that. And we can pray with you and talk with you if we can be of help to you in some way. Hey, I'm looking forward to being able to hang out with many of you at our potluck. So if you're here for that, it'll be over in the fireside room. If all you want is cookies, I'm told they're in the foyer. God bless you. Be strong in him.